Welcome to Potomac Hills. I'm glad you found us once again. We've been working through the Gospel of Mark for 34 weeks now. It's been one remarkable lesson after another. So I'm glad you've joined us this morning, and I hope you find it worthwhile. Before I start, please turn in your Bibles to Mark 11, and listen carefully as I read our scripture uh, for today. Mark 11, verses 12 through 25. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word and we need it. Thank you for giving us the scriptures and making us your people. We have uh, come this morning once again to this amazing gospel to learn more about your son Jesus. We ask you this morning simply to help us understand this hard teaching and then apply it to our lives. Help us to consider how the hard words of Jesus affects our ability to follow Jesus. And so we pray, speak through the Gospel of Mark this morning, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us see Jesus. For in his name we pray, amen and amen. For years, Joanne and I covered our refrigerator with magnets. Mostly magnets from places we've been, vacations we've had, that sort of thing. But there among the various magnets, we had a few magnets that looked like food. We had a lemon, a strawberry, a chocolate chip cookie, and everyone's favorite, a Snickers bar. Now, somewhere along the line, each of our five kids and a number of our grandkids uh, tried to sneak up to the fridge when they were sure no one was looking and tried to eat the Snickers bar, only to discover that these very real looking food items were in fact hard rubber magnets. While it was incredibly disappointing for them, it was pretty funny for the rest of us. They would give you these looks conveying this profound sense of having been cheated out of something good. And eventually, the magnets had so many teeth marks on them, we had to throw them all out. Many things can masquerade as the real thing, but then upon closer inspection, they let us down. Jesus deals with this sort of mismatch in a strange episode in the Gospels, the cursing of the fig tree. In the somewhat inverted miracle, we see the stakes not only of failing to produce fruit, but of giving a fruitful impression and then failing to back it up. So Jesus uses this fig tree as a living parable, an acted out illustration, a dramatic visual aid. And as I wrote earlier this week, 
we've come to two of Jesus' most frequently misunderstood actions, the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple, found in our text for today, Mark 11, verses 12 through 25. This is no surprise, for on their own, these two events are difficult to understand, but when read together, they explain each other. So let's dive in, and we'll start with Jesus cursing the fake fig tree. Verse 12. On the following day, when they came to Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So Mark, throughout his gospel, uses a sandwich technique where he begins telling one story, switches to a different story, and then comes back and finishes the first story. And so here, Mark begins telling the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree. And then he interrupts that story to describe Jesus driving out the money changers from the temple. Only then does he return to the story of the fig tree. And this is Mark's way of telling us that these two events are related to each other. Mark is telling us if we miss the meaning of the fig tree, then we'll miss the meaning of the cleansing of the temple as well. So Jesus enters Jerusalem amid exaltation from the masses gathered for Passover. We saw that back on Palm Sunday in the triumphal entry. So now it's the next morning. It is the Monday of Passion Week, of Holy Week. And so that morning he travels from Bethany and he spots a fig tree in leaf. Now at this point in late spring, most fig trees haven't developed a lot of fruit yet. As Mark tells us, verse 13, it was not the season for figs. But let me ask you, if you went to the Nationals Park in December looking for a ball game, you probably wouldn't find one because December isn't baseball season. And around here, most people don't go skiing in August because August isn't skiing season. The fig tree is doing nothing wrong. It's doing exactly what most would say it should be doing. So why does Jesus curse the tree? This particular tree draws Jesus' attention because it already has a full covering of leaves. It's an early bloomer. And its foliage, because it's fully covered with leaves, it's signaling that it should have figs, early figs. And with that expectation, Jesus is drawn to the tree, but he's immediately disappointed. All leaves, no fruit. All expectation, no satisfaction. And in this seemingly shocking response, Jesus curses the tree and makes it wither from the roots, never to yield fruit again. And we're a little taken aback. This seems stunningly out of character for Jesus. He's the welcomer of little children, the compassionate healer, the calmer of storms. And at first glance, it just looks like an example of Jesus losing his temper. So does Jesus have anything to teach us here other than how to lose our temper? And the answer is, of course. But the life-changing lesson lies amidst the overturned tables in the temple. The story of the cursing of the fig tree doesn't end here. Mark will pick it back up again after he tells us about the cleansing of the temple. Remember these stories, the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple are meant to interpret one another. So let's move on to the next story, which is cleansing the fake temple. So cursing the fake fig tree and cleansing the fake temple, starting at verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So Mark provides us with another sandwich. The fig tree 
the fig tree story uh, tops and tails this passage so that both themes seem to be intertwined. From the beginning of chapter 11, you have four stories. Temple, fig tree, temple, fig tree. And why are these image-filled stories put so closely together? Because the fig tree is seen as a symbol of Israel, and the temple is the spiritual center of Israel. And now both are seen to be dried up, corrupt, and utterly barren. And instead of bearing fruit at the dawn of the Messianic age, the fig tree has nothing but leaves. Like Israel, the fig tree is unable to deliver. At the appointed time, it's exposed as an empty sham. And the temple, too, had forgotten its original purpose. Mark mentions, verse 15, that Jesus entered the temple. Now, why is that significant? When you stepped inside the temple, the first area you entered was the court of the Gentiles. This is the only part non-Jews are allowed in. It's the biggest section. It's about the size of three football fields, so it's pretty big. And you have to go through it to get to the rest of the temple. All the business operations of the temple are set up here. So when Jesus walks in, he would have seen great throngs of people buying and selling animals at dozens of stalls and exchanging foreign currency at money changers' tables. Thousands of people flooded into Jerusalem for Passover, bringing and buying thousands of animals to be sacrificed. Think of how chaotic, how tumultuous and loud and confusing it was. Think of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and then add cattle. And with all the animal sellers and all the money changers setting up shop, there's no room for the Gentiles to worship. This is the place where the Gentiles are supposed to find God through quiet reflection and prayer. But the sale of animals and the exchange of money has made it impossible for God-fearing Gentiles to worship in the temple. And when you have no Gentiles, you can't be a house of prayer for all nations. And so Jesus responds with a holy anger. We read verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He just stops business. The temple is a place where people would go to meet God. They would have their greatest need fulfilled through fellowship with the Lord God of Israel. And from a distance, the temple appears to be doing pretty well. It appears to have it all together. The tree had leaves, if you will. However, upon a closer inspection from the Savior, the temple is as barren and fruitless as that fig tree. The tree is a picture of Israel. It should have had fruit on it. After all, it had leaves. Israel should have had fruit, but they rejected their Messiah. And there's a dreadful irony here. The true temple, Jesus, comes to this physical temple, and there's this polarizing reaction. On one hand, Jesus is infuriated. He moves through the temple and disrupts their bargaining with his presence and anger. On the other hand, the religious leaders are infuriated. Verse 18 says they're seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him. So we get a picture now of what's bothering Jesus from the two scripture passages that he quotes in this text. The first one he quotes is from Isaiah 56. The chapter is about bringing the Gentiles from all the nations to God's holy hill to worship him. And it ends with Isaiah 56, 7, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, that is, for the Gentiles. And we're told this astonished the crowd, all those who heard him. Why? Because it's popularly believed that the Messiah would show up and it would actually purge the temple of the foreigners. Instead here, Jesus is clearing the temple to make room for the Gentiles, and he's acting as their advocate. The next passage he quotes is from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. It says, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. 
Now, in the context of Jeremiah, the prophet is speaking to people who are using worship as a shelter for their fruitlessness and their unfaithfulness. And he likens them to thieves who uh, steal and then sneak off to a hideout to uh, count up their spoils. And he says that in doing that, they're turning God's house into a den of robbers. Jesus views the temple as the place where these robbers are coming to count the spoils of their irreligious and unethical lives. Now, Mark is the only gospel writer to put these two texts together, the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. He understood what the temple should have been, and he recognized what it had become. And here he shows Jesus exposing the sham, as did Jeremiah before him. And in Mark's scheme, God is rejecting Israel because she has failed to recognize her Messiah. And not only has Israel failed in this regard, she hasn't achieved her mission, which is to draw all nations to the worship of God. Now, I'm guessing at this point the disciples are pretty bewildered by what's going on. First, they have the cursing of the fig tree. They're not sure about that. Then the cleansing of the temple. They surely weren't expecting that. And so the next morning, when they're coming back and they see the withered fig tree, they point it out to Jesus. And expecting to get an explanation, what they get instead is a challenge to real faithfulness. A challenge to real faithfulness. Verses 20 through 25. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So faithfulness is about following Jesus, the one who is tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. We are to be perfect, the scriptures say, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And yet that perfection that we seek comes through faithful obedience, not primarily through rituals, but rather it's ethical. Primarily it's how we trust and obey God outside of the temple. Not the rituals inside the temple, but the obedience outside the temple, outside the church. As God says through the prophet Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We might say in light of these two intertwined stories in Mark 11, that God desires fruit, not leaves. God desires more than the appearance of fruitfulness. He desires actual fruitfulness. And at their core, both the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree are about the same thing, being faithful all the time, not only in season, but out of season as well, not only in the temple, but out of the temple, not only at worship on Sunday, but between Sundays as well. Just as a fruit tree is useless out of season, so is faith that just turns on and off with the times. Our fruit is to be born at all times, between Sundays, every day and every week. Disciples bear fruit in all seasons, not only when things are going our way, not only when it benefits us directly. We bear fruit even when we don't feel like bearing fruit. That's real faithfulness. This is God's will for us in Christ. The good news is that God has not left us alone to struggle with this incredible task of constant fruit bearing. He has given us the Holy Spirit as his power and his presence to transform us into the likeness of Christ. And as Paul says in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And what happens in the cleansing of the temple is the same thing that happens in the cursing of the fig tree. Jesus outwardly rebukes seasonal fruit-bearing. 
The fig tree has beautiful leaves but bears no fruit. And in a sense, the temple and all that it represents is the same as the barren fig tree. In a season when the kingdom of God has come near, the temple is a place where those sh uh, people should be able to go to eat its fruits and yet they go away hungry because it's been turned into a den of robbers. Just as those who look to the fruit, to the fig tree for fruit, they go away hungry, they go away disappointed. So those who go to the temple to be fed by the word of God, to worship God, to pray, don't find a house of prayer for all nations, but a den of robbers. And now in this challenge to real faithfulness, Jesus talks about two examples of the kind of fruit that's evidently missing in the courts of the temple. He tells the disciples there's two things that should emerge from you as a consequence of having faith in God. The first fruit we bear is believing prayer. Jesus talks about praying with great faith, the mountains being taken up and cast into the sea, believing prayer. Now Jesus is uh, not blessing a name it and claim it kind of prayer, not at all. Look at the second half of verse 23. If the one praying does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Not what I say. You are to believe that what he says will come to pass. Yes, what he says will come to pass. And what does he say? That which is promised in his word. We're to pray according to the will of God as it's revealed in the word of God. Believing that the promise of God uh, that all the promises that God have made will come true. Now, I know that prayer is hard. It's been evident the last three months. Those times we've stopped uh, our Sunday school class to pray, we get less people. Those times we've had all church prayer night, we've gotten less people. Those times we've had uh, community groups uh, meet just for prayer, we've had less people. And all those times go shorter. It's hard to pray. It's something that's not natural to us. It's supernatural. We need the Spirit of God for the power and presence in our lives in order for us to exhibit, to bear the fruit of believing prayer. Without the Holy Spirit, we just can't do it. The second fruit, he says, we have to bear is a forgiving heart. A willingness to forgive others because the lack of forgiveness is an obstacle to prayer. That's the kind of fruit he wants us to bear. So why is Jesus saying that here? Because if you retain a stubborn, bitter heart, an unwillingness to forgive others, a reluctance to pray with faith, then you're just as phony as those people that are selling animals in the court of the Gentiles in the temple in Jerusalem. He's saying if you can't do these things, believing prayer and have a forgiving heart, then you're no better than them. Now, that's pretty hard. And on the surface, it seems just like an object lesson on the power of believing prayer. But a lot more is going on behind the scenes. Because hidden in all of this dramatic imagery, some very serious warnings about the fruit of fruitlessness about the fruit of fruitlessness. He's told us what the problem is. And he's told us what we should do, bear fruit, and how that should be seen through having a forgiving heart and believing prayer. But there's a warning here about the fruit of fruitlessness. The cursing of the fig tree, this enacted parable of sorts, is a sober warning for us today, at least in two ways. The first warning's clear. Fruitlessness leads to judgment. Fruitlessness leads to judgment. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is described as God's vineyard, God's tree, God's planting. See that in Judges, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Any Israelite farmer would know, according to the law, the first fruits of the harvest belong to God, which is done to help them understand their relationship to God as his own special planting they have to yield spiritual fruit as his covenant people, as seen by bringing physical fruit as the first fruits of the harvest. And we see that imagery most famously again with the prophet Jeremiah. I know we spent a lot of time with Jeremiah, but here 
he comes back. Look at Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 10. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Israel's fruitfulness, literal or otherwise, is not the basis of the relationship with God. Several times in Deuteronomy, we're told that it's God who gives the fruitfulness. And a lack of fruitfulness is a sign of God's curse for their rebellion, for their sin. This is a foundational metaphor for Israel's spiritual health. It's most vividly pronounced by the prophets. But the time has come for God's people to bear fruit that in turn is going to bless all the nations, the rest of the world. Isaiah 27, just one of many examples. In days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Several times the prophets describe God as inspecting Israel for early figs, as a sign of spiritual fruitfulness. One example of that, again, is in Jeremiah 8. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. So in the exile, God pours out his curse on them, and Israel becomes a rotten fig. And that's what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. But all is not lost because there's still uh, lots of promises for the regathering of God's people. God promises that one day he'll replant Israel and produce healthy figs from her again. We see that in Joel 2. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. Micah 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. We are about to experience our own regathering of having been in this uh, sort of worship exile for a while. And as we regather, as every time in the Bible God's people regather, he's begging them, looking at them, bear fruit to show that you are my disciples. That's going to be the burden on us as we regather. Not just that we'll get to see each other, not just that we'll get to worship together, but that we will be built up by God's Holy Spirit through prayer and through the preaching of God's Word so that we will bear fruit and be able to demonstrate to the outside world Monday through Saturday, that we are his disciples. So you have this massive biblical imagery of what it means to bear fruit throughout the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, and now here in the Gospel of Mark. And so when they hear this all about uh, this fruit bearing and these fig trees and uh, all that Jesus is saying, he's essentially reenacting Israel's history here. Light bulbs would be going off in the disciples' minds. They'd be thinking of all the spiritual implications. They didn't get it at first. At first, they didn't see it at all. But as Jesus starts to explain what he wants, what bearing fruit really looks like, we're reminded of other things that he says. We see this a number of time in, uh, times in the book of Acts where they're reminded of something Jesus had previously said. But we're seeing that God's people are called to produce spiritual fruit. Matthew 3, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. With the arrival of Christ, the restoration of Israel has begun. Everything's lining up. Israel's fruit will now be harvested, blessing will now pour forth, and while the rest of the nations, the other fig trees, are not yet in season, this fig tree is in leaf. And Mark, by sandwiching the fig tree episode around the temple episode, focuses the lens on where all the events of the Holy Week are going to happen at the temple in Jerusalem. Except there's no fruit. The fig tree once again has failed. The Passover celebration, tumultuous uh, sounds of the crowds and the singing, it turns out it's all just for show. Jesus enters God's house of prayer and finds it a den of robbers. Lots of action, lots of bustle, no righteousness. Leaves, but no fruit. So upon inspecting this fruitless tree, Jesus pours out divine judgment with two actions, two signs, the cleansing of the temple and this acted out parable of the cursing of the fig tree. But all is not lost. You see, when the disciples expect Jesus to explain what just happened, he pivots and talks about believing prayer. Why? Because he wants them and us to think about your own figs. To think about your own figs. The disciples don't understand yet, but they'll, uh, they will at one point that they're going to become the new caretakers of God's people. The disciples will become the apostles. That's part of the point of the parable of the tenants. When Jesus told the chief priests and Pharisees that they're going to be replaced. Matthew 21. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. The disciples will be the instruments by which Israel is transformed when the followers of Christ, beginning with the disciples, extends the branches of the church worldwide and brings forth fruit from all nations. And we'll see that beginning in the book of Acts. And as Jesus teaches here, they will do this by the power of believing prayer. This cursing of the fig tree is not just about historical Israel. It's about us. It's about all the people of God. The Old Testament expectation that God's covenant people bear fruit didn't wither on that road uh, between Bethany and Jerusalem when that poor fig tree met its untimely end. In fact, the mandate that God's people bear spiritual fruit has actually been strengthened not weakened. Jesus said, John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. When we take the warnings of this passage seriously, we realize it's not just reminding us uh, that a Christian, by definition, must bear spiritual fruit, even if it's just small early figs. But it's also about the threat of and the temptation towards the false pretenses of fruit. The fig tree, like the bustling temple courts during Passover, was putting on a good show. And that made it even worse. It's one thing to lack fruit out of season. It's another thing to lack fruit while pretending that you have it. So let us be warned. Our personal lives can look an awful lot like a fig tree in leaf. Our lives may look like those of a supermom, or a winner at work, or a perfect family, or an A-team Christian with an overstuffed schedule. But the root may be withered. There may be no fruit of holiness, no intimacy of God, 
no fruit in keeping with repentance. And what's worse, our leaves may serve to fool even ourselves. Churches can do the same thing. A church's leaves can look pretty impressive. Good attendance, solid finances, impressive music, even clever pastors. But what's the Lord going to find on close inspection? Will he find just leaves or will he find fruit? The Apostle Paul writes that on the day of Christ, will we be found, Philippians 1, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. These two stories in Mark 11 are a word of warning to us. That word is not that if we sin, we'll be cursed. God's grace is too deep and too wide for that. However, people or churches that over time become dens of robbers are cursed. Their tables are turned over. Or to put it in the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, their lampstands are taken away. This is the word of God to us this morning. It's a difficult word to be sure, but it is a word of God nonetheless. So let us delight in it and learn it and study it so that we can become like the righteous man in Psalm 1, where it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Think about that. You need to pray. Take a moment to do that, and then I'll close. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, once again, thank you that you have given us a king. Help us to see our sin and then see our Savior. Open our eyes that we might not be fruitless people, but faithful people whose lives are marked by believing prayer. We thank you for the gift of faith, and we pray tonight, or this morning, that you would fill us with that faith, that you would make us men and women of prayer. We want people to think about Potomac Hills as a place that's filled with men and women who love to pray. And so we pray, Lord, give us the grace of forgiveness and remove from us the obstacle of bitterness. Father, once again, we're thankful and grateful to you for your word and especially for the revelation of Jesus as the fulfillment of all that which Scripture speaks of. And as always, help us to know and believe that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hopefully, keep praying, we'll see you live and in person next week.